Terms of references for evaluations. This video was shot at the Interact event Impact Evaluations, Methods and Terms of References on the 21st of June 2016 in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. In this video you will hear about how a typical structure of terms of references looks like, how should the most relevant sections look like, and what do you need to consider when you're drafting a terms of reference for impact evaluations. The topic of today is the terms of reference, which is actually the most important thing in an evaluation. If you think about it, you can have the best evaluation plan ever, you can have the lot of money, you can have the best evaluator, but if you didn't define your terms of reference correctly, you will not have a good evaluation. There are certain things uh, uh, why you have to do it, but I think we can already go to the second slide. The most important issue with the terms of reference in our environment is the double purpose of the terms of reference. On one hand, you want to do the terms of reference in order to do your public procurement, in order to select the the company, the evaluator who will do your evaluation. On the other hand, it is also a contractual agreement, so there is an inherent conflict in this document. On one hand, you want it to be as defined as possible because you want to be sure that all of the things uh, 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 you, want, uh, you want to be done, it is there in the document. On the other hand, you also want to use it for public procurement. So. If you, then if you use it for, uh, for uh, the public procurement, then you need to be sure that there, is, uh, there, is, there are certain details which are not in the terms of reference that enables you to, uh, to select the right evaluator. And we will come back to that, to this message several times because this is a very important message. How, what, what, are the, uh, what are the attributes which enables you to select the, the right evaluator? There is a typical structure. This is a structure we made up. Of course, you can use any structure you want. Uh, 20 minutes. First of all, in, in our typical structure, you, you, you begin with uh, the evaluation purpose and the audience. Then you talk about the objectives. Then you come to the questions. Then you explain the approach, the methodology, and then the timing of the deliverables. And then uh, you talk about the team composition, the management arrangements, the budget and payment, and uh, what are how, how, how the proposal can be submitted. O again, this is a lot of things. I will concentrate on uh, the few which I think are the most relevant. We so the background and, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, context is very important. And I think the most important part, there are many parts which you have to explain in the background uh, uh, and uh, and uh, the context. But the most important part, and that was the same for the evaluation plans, if you remember what was in the background, that what is the evidence which is available? Okay? I think this is something which, which really has to be there. What is the context where this program operates and what is the evidence which, which is available? Anything you don't give to your evaluator, they will have to find it or they will have to make it up and all these things cost money. So you have, that's something which they cannot do for you. You know, you know the documents which you received, you know the guidances you, you received, you know the small impact. But you always want to know and you always have to understand that the, your evaluator must be the best evaluator in the world and knows evaluation and methods really, but probably you much more know your policy area and you much more know what is the evidence which is available. So that's something which you, you, cannot leave, you, you cannot leave without that. And that's why when you do your evaluation plans, and that's ir, ir, independently from, from a single TOR, you always have to collect. You need to have open a, a directory in your share drive or something like that, where you put all relevant information which can be used in different evaluations. You receive a document from a researcher, you receive a, 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 a guidance to the, from, from the commission. There is a change in the, in the objectives. All these things have to go inside and you, 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 have, to, you have to make it available. If we go to the next one. There is evaluation objective and scope. It's, it sounds silly, but and I'm saying that normally no more, you should not say no more two or three objectives, but I, I was thinking about that, and I think in your case, I would say one objective. 
So to, to try to say, okay, one single objective, why you want to do this evaluation. And in my experience, it is very useful. When you, because when you will do the evaluation, you will have a lot of discussion on the deliveries. How, what is the interpretation of this question? What did you mean? Why do we do it? But if you have one guiding objective, then you can always go to back. And you can always tell your evaluators, okay, whenever you have uh, a, a question or whenever you can't understand why you want to, do, what, what this question means in the, in the evaluation questions, or why do, what do you have to do in, in this task? You always have to go back to the objectives. What is the objective of the evaluation? If the objective of the evaluation is to understand the impact uh, of uh, a certain objective, then they have to think about that. That always, whenever they, they have to interpret a question, they have to have in mind that the main, the main purpose is to understand the impact. Or it can be the main purpose is to, to be compliant. Or the main purpose is to understand the risks. Or the main purpose is to look at the implementation. But then, if for, for your evaluator, it's, it's, it's much easier if you have a clear objective. For the scope, it's again very important because that, that limits the focus of the evaluation. Of course, you can never evaluate everything. You always have to have uh, a time focus, a period focus, a geographical focus, a thematic focus. All these things have to be clarified. So again, if you do it well, this will be again part of the compass of your evaluator. So you can always tell them, whenever you have questions, please go back to the document and read it. And actually that's true for the, for, for the terms of reference always. We, everybody gets carried away during an evaluation because as the evaluation goes on and some information is received, immediately you have new questions. Oh, wow, maybe we should do that. Maybe we should, maybe we should also check that because as, as a person, as an inter intellectual person, you want to know the answers for every question you have immediately. So that's, a, that's, that, that's, that's the way we work. And that's why you always need to go back to your original terms of reference. Otherwise, you have a problem. Or then you need to modify the terms of reference. You always go back, and then you, OK, you agree uh, how, how you can handle it. Uh, and you reconsider it again. OK, this was an interesting question. But would I want to sacrifice another question for this? Because obviously, you already agreed how many questions will be answered from the, from the budget and from the money in the terms of reference. And th these are simple things, but very important. And I can say for, from experience, if you are carried away and you add too much during the evaluation, at the end you will get no answers. So the issues of the greatest concern should be addressed. So you really have to be specific. And it is very important that the questions you raise are answerable. So it's not like that, oh, I don't know what's the route for happiness, so let's ask that. No, you need to, you need to, have, you need to, have, uh, uh, you need to have an idea how to do it. You don't do it because you don't have the resources, or you don't know how to apply methodologies, or you don't have the time. But at the end of the day, you have already in mind, you know this is possible to answer. And you know that, for example, you ask, are my stakeholders happy about my intervention? You know that it is an answerable question. The only thing you have to do is go to the stakeholders, design a good survey, and then ask them whether they are happy. So you know this is an answerable question. And that's very important that every question you, uh, uh, you raise, you need to think about that, and you need to discuss with some other people. But may, maybe you think it's answerable, but maybe some others not. So you ha that, it has to be an agreement. And again, this will, this, this, this will depend, uh, your, your, the output or the outcome of your evaluation will depend on this. Also, how many uh, questions you have. So normally, and again, we do it like that. So we, we uh, separate the, the evaluation, the TOR, into tasks. And every task uh, re, uh, has a main question. And all these tasks has a, a logical sequence which we think will enable to address the main objective of the evaluation. If it's logical, it's important to be logical because that, that will be the sequence how uh, you will be, uh, how they will deliver on it. 
Also, you can decide for which tasks you want to have deliverables. And that's, that's something which, we, which comes up. So I think this is something which we discussed. I think you, these are certain questions which you can always raise in, a, in, in an impact evaluation. So what is the change which we observed in relation to the objectives? How much this change can be attributed to my intervention? These are core questions of impact evaluation which you have to raise basically always. Are there other impacts? Because most of the time you will see, okay, maybe there was no change. Maybe there was change, but actually if, if I look at any analysis or statistics, it's not because of me. But did, any, did I have any other impact? Because may, and and this, this comes back to the, to the main question where that you have this double objective of cooperation and, and, and also you have your, your, your thematic objectives and you, have also, you want to leverage also on this cooperation. Sometimes you manage to leverage, sometimes you don't. Sometimes some, uh, the end should be just the cooperation. Sometimes uh, some other people here in the room think it should, you should leverage and it should be economic and social integration at the end. I mean, but you have to think of these objectives and you have to think also when you talk with uh, uh, your evaluators that what, what other unintended impacts can be which should be looked at and which, which should be noted. Of course, it looks much better if you say that although I didn't reach my objectives, but I reached other objectives. And then that's what you present for the monitoring community. You say, look, this, we thought this intervention will solve the problems of the area, but actually uh, they, don't, they, they do not solve the, the unemployment issues of the area, but they itself solve something else. So they are good, this instrument is good, but not for the purpose which we thought of. And then, then it, this merits a good discussion. Also, what mechanisms deliver the impact? And what, are, what is the context? So why did this intervention have an impact? What, how did it work which, 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 which got you to the impact? Of course, you had your, uh, uh, your theory of change, but your theory of change is always a theory. The real change works a little bit differently. So, uh, and when you will do your evaluation, you will see how the change really worked. So you have to understand the mechanisms. Why you have to understand the mechanisms? Because you need to know whether this is transferable or not. What was the context? Was, this, was your intervention working or not working because of the uh, economic crisis? Because it's possible. Because it's possible you had the perfect intervention, which would have worked always, but there was the financial crisis, so suddenly companies were fighting for survival rather than for, for investing in future and long-term uh, uh, long strategies. And that's why it didn't work. Or you can turn around. Maybe the uptake of your funds was so high because because of the uh, economic crisis, they didn't have any other source of income, so they would do anything mm -hmm. to take your projects. Again, does this mean that your intervention is transferable for a new period? Obviously not, except if you think that every seven years there will be a crisis. <laughs> a lot of people think that, so you might be right, but, that, that's, again, but that's again that you, which, what, what, you have to, what you have to consider. And also, there is a, a, a question, and I think when yesterday uh, we discussed the, the case study which, which Daniela prepared, and it had five different sectors which the intervention, the innovation intervention addressed. This is a very important question, because if you address five different sectors, maybe your intervention is good for three of them and not for two, and you want to know that. Maybe the, uh, the manufacturing industry will li really uh, like it, and maybe the, the startups will not like it in, in high tech, because for them, this is not interesting. So also, if you can get answers to this, it will again help you in the transferability and the, and the policy learning. And also, whether, of course, you will look at uh, uh, the, the, the short-term effects, but of course the question is whether is there any difference between the short-term and long-term effects. You can only look at that if you also take in your case study 
or, you, uh, or, or, or in your examples, uh, a project uh, or an intervention from the previous period, which you can do. So if you continued uh, the intervention for a long time, the longer you continue, the better you can look at long-term impacts. If you, if you're, but there are a lot of questions in, in, in this. The core of the TOR, or another core of the TOR, and here again you have a problem with procurement. Because you can just decide yourself exactly what you want and exactly what methods uh, you want them to, uh, to, to use in your terms of reference. Or you can just say, this is the task, this is the question, and you say the tenderer should uh, propose a method. You make a list of methods which you think are possible methods, and then the tenderer should propose in different tasks how they should mix and match these methods. Again, the more specific you are, the better it will be, the, 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 the more it will be delivered. On the other hand, that gives, puts some inflexibility in the system. And the advantage of a second solution, in addition to flexibility, is that you can test the evaluator with it. So based on their mix and match, you can compare the evaluator. Because if you specify everything in your tender, then it's easy. Anybody can copy paste and put a number below the task. And then you will have to take the one which is the cheapest. Maybe you are lucky, maybe not. But what is the worst thing is to have an evaluator who will not give you a, 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 a good product. Because it's not only that you lose money, you also use time and resources, and you, use, and you lose reputation. And all this for, for a document which doesn't add you any value. So you always have to start with the theory of change independently with what kind of uh, uh, evaluation you, you, impact evaluation you perform. Again here, uh, I would really go back to the documents which you already have. Go back to your evaluation plans, go back to your, uh, 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 to your uh, even the regulation, go back to your uh, ex ante if there was any evaluation. Probably your ex ante evaluations are not perfect, but maybe there are certain parts which are good. Maybe the part on the needs is good, and that already helps the evaluator to understand what are the needs of the area, and then you can, then you can look at the objectives from different point of view. Also, it is very important, already you understood that it's important to have the data, but it's also important that you give this data to the evaluator because otherwise it has no value at all. So you really have to <coughs> outline in your terms of reference what is the data which is available, what is in your monitoring system. I would suggest, and that's something which we do continuously, we always transparently admit if something is wrong. So for example, when we did the, we, when we, when we did the, the expos for the last uh, uh, programming period, we wrote in every TOR that, look, we have output indicators, but be careful with the output indicators because we only started to have common indicators as of 2010. And it was not a must, and we already, during our reviews, we only have always had problems with it. So the evaluators knows that in his offer, he has to implement some quality checks. And you also know the evaluator who did not pick on this, uh, on this uh, point is not a good evaluator. You don't want to have a person who you notify that there's a problem with data and not the first thing he's not doing is checking uh, uh, the consistency of data and uh, implementing some quality and, 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 and uh, data clearing procedures because that's, that's something which, which you would really expect. So you can really be, be the more, you have to be transparent on what, what exists, what not, and if you can qualify uh, this. You can say, look, there are certain statistics which we think it's useful for the evaluation, but these are, checking, these are just indicative informations because of certain reasons, because we understand, for example, that this 
statistics relate not only to our region, but it's whatever not Stu, and on not Stu level, we are, uh, we are not the same, so there might be some, uh, uh, some problems with it. All these things, I think, are important. So for theory-based evaluations, you, you want to understand why your program had or not had an impact, that's, that we talked about the context. It is also, you want to investigate, you want to see what are the causal linkages between your inputs, activities, outputs and impacts. And that's something cannot be repeated as many times. And whenever you don't see these logical links, you have to be suspicious, there is something wrong. You always have to look, and I would even go further from the needs, but that's for programming, I would also ask the question just for myself whether my programming was good or bad. If you know it was bad, you don't have to answer it. <laughs> and then you look, okay, what were the inputs? And again, if you didn't have any inputs, notably there was no uptake of a specific objective, there is, you can stop that, uh, the, uh, that evaluation. If there were no projects, then you could not have an impact. And this is, this is, this is, this is a, a common sense thing, but this really has to be uh, uh, followed up. That has, but if there were no projects which could have impacted that result indicator, the only thing which you can uh, uh, come up with is just the natural trend of the result indicator which might be reasonable to do, but then you have to have uh, good reasons to do it. And then you have to screen, scru scrutinize all these assumptions. That means you have to check whether this causal link, is it true? I mean, are these indicators or are these attributes changing really because of me or not? And you have to make, you have to triangulate, you have to make many tests on, of the same thing to confirm it. Well, no, because that's, but at the end of the day, you have to do, you have to address the same question with many methods, and that's again a good test of an evaluator, whether he's relying on one single method. He goes to, uh, uh, he goes to uh, uh, a stakeholder, asks uh, something, and that's it, and that's the conclusion, or he tries to look for some other uh, views to confirm this, uh, this, uh, this evidence or this statement. I mean, honestly, and I, if you want to do it, you can, but I don't, I really, I looked at a few of your uh, uh, interventions and I don't see any merit for doing a counterfactual evaluation because of many reasons, but that doesn't mean that you cannot uh, use the spirit of the counterfactual evaluation and do okay in, in, in your methods to have some kind of control groups or, or to, to use difference in difference. That means the theory of difference is difference that there is a natural trend and there is your intervention. So you, you cannot just take the before and after comparison. So if the GDP has grown 5% in seven years in your area, you just can't say that it's because of you, you have to think of or you have to test how much would have been the natural growth. So maybe it would have been 4% and then your impact is the 1% which is the difference. To do it in a statistical valid way, it would be impossible, but that doesn't mean that in the spirit of your tests, you cannot, you cannot look at that or you cannot take it as one, one component. Further considerations, do we always need, uh, we can go further, do we always need counterfactual as we discussed, I don't think you can do it. Of course the best would be, I don't, we always talk about theory based evaluations and counterfactual evaluations are two separate methods of, actually it's not true. Actually, Counterfactual methods are one of the methods which you can also use in any evaluation. And actually, you, the theory, I would never do an evaluation which doesn't look at the theory. Because otherwise, it becomes a black box and you don't know why the intervention is working and you don't know how, whether uh, you don't know the context and you don't know anything about the transferability. So you always have to, you always have to match these methods. Again, if you can do at, 
at any any element uh, uh, of the intervention, you can do some counterfactual. That's very nice, and it would be. It, it gives you. I mean, it's very clear. If you have, if you, if you have statistically valid results, it's always better than an interview. Because that's strong. That's that that's that that's strong data. I mean, it's there is no there is no the bias is much. The problem with with all the theory based and all qualitative. Uh, 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 tests is really the the bias is really high. It really depends on the person who does it. You can't, you couldn't possibly make sit uh, put three people in these three different tables and to tell them to do a qualitative analysis, and it's impossible that the three of them would come to the same result. It would it would always be different because it will defend. It will depend on the level of the English of the person, it will depend uh, on his cultural background, on his experience, and so on. If you put a good defined econometric test and you put the three people there, it, you have the same results. Because there are rules for that, and, and, and there are statistics has a rule, have, have rules, uh, while theory-based evaluation is qualitative, it, it per, per definition cannot have. What is very important is that the evaluations are used. So that's 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 that's, that's always always the, the 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 most important thing that you involve the monitoring community in every level of the evaluations. Okay, so I mean, create some expectations. Okay, so when you start, uh, when you plan your evaluation, create some expectations. So let's let's already discuss when you when you write your TOR again, discuss it with the monitoring committee and tell them what will be the outcome. And if they say they want something more or something less, then you can tell them what you think it's possible, what you think is not possible, whether we can change it. But the more the more you talk about it, the more the uptake of the of the of the results will be yeah. yes so is there an ideal evaluation obviously not so every method and approach has its weaknesses strengths also has its costs so looking at your budget that's a concern you have i mean it has a cost you have you really have to take the best value for money i think it should be very specific and we cannot get back enough on this question and I think we have to repeat that it, your questions have to be really really specific if you ask general questions you will have no answers to that and I think the objectives you have some of you are already enough general to create a problem so if you don't become more specific uh, uh, you will you, you will not have you will not have a good evaluation also the triangulation principle we already discussed uh, again the cost of the evaluation needs to be justified by the by the knowledge you gain. That's again obvious, but that will be not one of your concerns, I think, because you don't have such big budget. And uh, again, it is very important what you already know of your intervention have to be considered. That's the shared drive I told. So put everything there, every information you received, you know about the intervention be there. And that's also also about the implementation. It's not only about studies. Maybe there are useful things about the implementation or problems with, 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 uh, with the projects which, which needs to be noted. Uh, and of course, there is no best method. I mean, uh, methods are different and, and, uh, and uh, they work sometimes and they don't work the other time. Then, it's again very important, as I told, to look at the things uh, uh, which you already have. I told them already about the excellent evaluations. And of course, there are other evidence and other resources. That's the, and then you have, again, a lot, 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 lot of side. I think a lot of people, uh, uh, a lot of learning is generated by Interreg. What is not happening too much is really on uh, capitalization on this learning so that uh, projects share experience with each other and share knowledge. And a lot of information is there. If you'd like to see more details about the evaluation of Interreg programs and projects, please check out the different models Interact produced.
In each of the models, you will find various materials such as videos, guidance papers, Q&A documents, links and other details.